everyone. Before we start the episode, we want to take a little time to give a shout out to a local nonprofit right here in East Providence, Rhode Island, JDP Theatre Co. JDP Theater is a women's own nonprofit theater that is committed to inclusivity, accessibility, and professionalism. With a team of hardworking volunteers, they put on shows for kids, teenagers, and young adults. They also offer wonderful after school programs, including theme camp programs over school breaks to teach theater to kids in a creative way, such as Witches and Wizards Camp or Superhero Summer Camp. JDP is also proud to announce their new program, Your Stage, which allows college students to put on their own semi-professional shows and gain work experience in the arts industry. It should also be noted that JDP has been able to host theatrical events as well as community events such as their Pumpkin Harvest, all while adhering to the appropriate guidelines during the COVID-19 pandemic because the safety and health of their staff is a priority. But if you can't take our word for it, even though my daughter did two shows with them and has known these people since she was in middle school, check out the reviews on their website, on social media, or on Google. And if that's not enough, JDP has been ranked a top-rated nonprofit by greater nonprofits. They have received the GuideStar Platinum Seal of Transparency, and they have received second place in the Providence Journal's Reader's Choice Awards for live theater and family amusement. So check out JDP Theater Company at JDP Theater Co. Dot com or pay a visit to their Facebook and Instagram pages. Thank you for listening, and good night. Uh, can we do the show now? Don't we have a show to do? Oh yeah, we have an album to review. Let's get on with the show. Hello, and welcome to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. I am Juliet the Daughter. And as ever, I am Kevin the Dad. And Jules, who did you pick for this time? Well, we've sort of done George. We've done Bob. We've done Roy. So next in our Wilbury list, we're going to do Jeff Lynn and ELL. So, Dad, what do we need to know? Well, this week we delve once again into Dad Rock, which I'm sure we've done previously. This counts as Dad Rock? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, that's sad. Well, like, this shouldn't they be counted as something other than Dad Rock? Uh, well, I did my research on Dad Rock, and they are listed as a Dad Rock band. Oh, okay. Is one, of, it... one of the finest. Oh, I was about to say, is that an insult, Dad Rock, or no? It, it depends. Oh, okay. Being a dad kind of makes me feel old. Sorry. Nah, it's okay. Moving on. But another thing that said Dad Rock is it's like us boomers are pushing our musical tastes onto the younger generation. Ah. So if you feel that ELO and other bands have been forced on you... Too bad. <laughs> yes, and we are covering another traveling Wilbury as well. As you said, we've done George. Sort of. Then we did Roy. Yep. Then we did Bob. Yep. Maybe someday Tom. Yeah, we'll do Tom eventually. And now it's Jefflin's turn, whether he wants it or not. Yeah. Now, depending on your point of view, ELO is Jeff Lynn, or ELO is Jefflin and some other guys, maybe. Most people, <laughs> most people go with the form of you. As such, we'll cover what Jeff was up to when the band took a 14-year break. Whoa. But first, we're going to co- cover the band. 14 years? Is 14 the... years. You're going to tell us why, right? Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll get okay, to that. Okay, don't, don't worry. Cool. I, I did my homework. As always. All right. Ah, the band, the Electric Light Orchestra, commonly known as ELO. Mm-hmm. They have a great logo. Yeah, they do. They I like do. it. It's very good. Never Critical Darlings. Just uncool. Oh. Uncool enough to sell 50 million records from 1973 to 1986. Take that, critics. And Jeff Lynne, scorned by rock and roll snobs for daring to elevate himself to the level of Roy, Tom, Bob, and George in the Traveling Wilburys. <laughs> Suck it, snobs. <laughs> is he in the Rock Snobs Dictionary? Yes, he is, oh, as no. uh, one of the people that snobs are required to hate. Screw the snobs, man. For things such as his bubble hairdo... Um, his Birmingham his Birmingham accent, which is more ridiculous than Ozzy's. That's where he's from. Yeah. Okay. And then you know, for daring to elevate himself to the same level as George, Roy, Tom, and Bob. Well, they let him in, so you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. They, they All right. Made the choice. Anyway. Yep. Yeah. Back in 1968, Roy Wood of British band rock band The Move came up with an idea to form a new band that would use violins, cellos string basses, horns, and woodwinds, and rock out. Quote, pick up where the Beatles left off, unquote. I'm assuming he meant the, mag- the magical mystery tour of Sgt. Pepper Beatles. Basically, take Strawberry Fields Forever and run that sucker into the ground. <laughs> now, Jeff Lynne, 
who was fronting a Birmingham, that's England, not Alabama, yeah. group, the Idol Race, was into the concept. When Move guitarist Trevor Burton left in 1969, Roy asked Lynn to join, but Jeff said no. He wanted to focus on the Idol Race. In 1970, when Move singer Carl Wayne quit, Roy Wood asked Jeff again to join. This time he said yes, but... Oh no, there's always a but. And it's a big one. On the condition that they focused on the orchestra concept. Oh, okay. Their first song, meant to be a move B-side, was the 10358 Overture, written by Jeff. Yeah, we're just going to call him by his first name now. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. The number refers to the ex escaped prisoner in the song. Now, the plan was for the move to have their release, Looking On, be the final move album. But in order to finance ELO, they put out one more album, Message from the Country, whilst also recording their debut, The Electrical Light Orchestra. That debuted in December 1971. When it was released in 1972 in the U.S., it was retitled No Answer. Okay, how come it got retitled? Um, because I guess the record types in England were trying to reach Jeff, and the reaction was No Answer. Ah, okay. Thus, no answer. Her album titles mm -hmm. made. Okay, now the debut concert lineup was Roy Wood, mm -hmm. Jeff, Bev Bevan on drums, who was also in the move, mm -hmm. Richard Tandy on bass, mm -hmm. but soon to rule the keyboards, <laughs> and five guys on strings. Sorry, guys. Oh, they didn't list their names. Yeah, they did. Oh, but 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 the thing is, like, like they kept changing the lineup over the years. Oh, I see. With different guys playing the uh, the orchestra stuff. Oh, okay. Okay. Roy Wood left during the recording of ELO's second album called ELO 2. <laughs> the three like Queen 2. Didn't they do Queen 2? Yep. Yeah. And unlike Chicago, who did Chicago 1, Chicago 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11... Umpty fuck. Yeah, I forgot <laughs> what number they're on now. Yeah. But they actually titled one album Hot Streets, maybe because they didn't know how to do the number 12 or 13 in Roman numerals. Anyway. That, that, that's easy. Just add another letter I. There you go. To the X. <laughs> anyway, ELO2 gave the band its first hit, a cover of Chuck Berry's Roll Over Beethoven. Mm. And we'll have more on that song when we get to the review part. Yeah. ELO made their first appearance on American Bandstand that year as well. Oh, wow. In late 73, a third album, On the Third Day, was released. So that's two albums in one year. Nice. And those were the days where it wasn't like five or six years between albums. Mm. Album number three yielded the hit Showdown, which is not on this compilation, compilation but mm. it is on others, and yes, I do have it on my iPod. Okay. For album number four, El Dorado, Jeff stopped multi-tracking the strings and hired a string arranger, orchestra, and choir. He was just going to go big on this one. Mm -hmm. Can't Get It Out of My Head hit the top ten in the U.S. in 1974. Now the band is hitting its stride, cranking out an album of year with at least two or three hits off of each one. They also appeared on the Midnight Special more times than any other band had on that show. Four mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. The band also holds the record... I don't know if they'd be proud of this, for uh -oh. having the most Billboard Hot 100 top 40 hits, 20 of them, without a number one single of any band in U.S. chart history. Oh. I'm Casey Kasem. <laughs> in 1977, they put out the double album, Out of the Blue, and went on a nine-month, 92-date tour. Whoa. They had a huge set consisting of a hugely expensive spaceship stage, fog machines, and lasers. Because it was the 70s, man. Yeah. And I remember actually seeing it on TV. There was actually, this was the 70s, mm -hmm. someone somewhere came up with the idea of, hey, let's do a TV show version of People magazine. And I do remember them covering ELO, and they showed part of the Out of the Blue tour, and this stage was just massive. Mm. Massive. They played Wembley for eight straight sold-out shows. Whoa. By 1979, they were at their peak to the point of inspiring Randy Newman's parody, or maybe tribute, <laughs> probably more the former, I bet, song, The Story of a Rock and Roll Band. And the irony is that years later, Jeff would work with Randy. Oh, really? Yep. Well, that makes sense considering how big Randy's family is in the music business, so it's mm. not surprising. They also hit the top 40 six times in a one-year period from August 1970 to August 1980. Once again, I'm Casey Kasem.
No, I'm Casey Kasem. Oh, sorry. Also in 1980, Jeff was asked to contribute songs to the movie Xanadu. That's them backing up Olivia Newton-John on the title song. Oh, yeah, the one with Olivia Newton-John and Gene Kelly. And was it Zan Warren in that one, too? Am I thinking I don't know. And roller skating. Yeah, Gene, it was Gene Kelly and, uh, and uh, Olivia Newton-John. That's mm-hmm. what I remember. Yeah. In, 1990, in 1981, with their album Time, it was Goodbye Strings, Hello Nurse. I mean, uh, <laughs> Hello Synthesizers. Yep. After that, Jeff wanted to do another double album. CBS said no. It'd be too expensive, and it wouldn't sell as well as a single disc. Hmm. So Secret Messages came out in 1983, but there was no tour to promote it. Jeff was discouraged by that, as well as CBS telling him it was going to be one disc and not two. And he had a falling out with the band's manager, Don Uh Arden, Uh father of Sharon Osbourne. Really? Yeah, he he, uh, also managed... um, I believe he also managed Black Sabbath and then oh. tried managing Ozzy solo until Sharon moved in and they actually, father and daughter, just battled each other over... Ozzy? Over Ozzy. Oh. Apparently Sharon won, I guess. I guess. Is her dad still alive or is he gone? I. Th- that's a good question. I, I want to say I think he might be gone, but he was known to have these sporadic appearances on uh, their show, The Osbournes, on MTV. What's his name? Don Arden. A R D E N. Don Arden. English agent. Do, do, do. Yeah, he died in 2007. Okay. So after all that, Jeff just decided, you know what? I'm calling it a day. Mm-hmm. So he moved on to producing. One of his first efforts was producing two songs for Dave Edmonds' album, Information. One of those songs, Slipping Away, was Edmund's return to the top 40 for the first time since I Hear You Knocking from 1970. So it was 13 years between top 40 appearances. So mm-hmm. Jeff must have known really what he was doing. Really meant it, yeah. He produced six songs on Edmund's follow-up, Riff Raff, and one song for the Everly Brothers reunion album, EB84. Oh, wow. But, but Jeff was contractually obligated to deliver one more ELO album, so in 1986, he, Bev Bevan, and Richard Tandy went in the studio as a three-piece, and in 1986 came out with Balance of Power with the top 20 hit, Calling America. Hello? America? Yeah. Is your refrigerator running? Go get it! There you go. You may want to catch it. <laughs> uh, the band did play a few shows, one of them the Birmingham Heartbeat Charity Concert. And who should appear on stage to jam on Johnny B. Good? Chuck? One lonesome George Harrison. Oh, George. Okay. Oh, yeah. I think, what year did you say that was again? 1986. Yeah, Danny Harrison said that he, I think he might have went to that concert another time. He went to one of ELO's concerts where George went on stage to play Johnny B. Good, And because he was so small, he thought that aliens had abducted his dad. That probably might have been the one. Yeah. Um, in 1989, Bev Bevan started ELO Part 2, Roman numerals and all. He co-owned the ELO name with Jeff. This version lasted till 1999. Bev sold his share, share, sold his share of the ELO name to Jeff in 2000, Whoa. who reactivated the band, and Bev ended up calling it the orchestra. Okay. Instead, uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. There's that 1986-1999 stretch yeah. of Jeff's life that needs some going over. Yeah. What the hell happened? So in 19 19- in 1987, he produced George Harrison's comeback, Cloud Nine, yep. giving George a number one hit with Got My Mind Set on You, which uh-huh. is the very last Sotal Beatles number one hit. Take and, that, Paul. <laughs> and the thing is, George also got the very first Sotal Beatles number one hit. My sweet lord. Uh-huh. Now, here's what I'm bitter about. Why did they cut Jeff Lynne from the George Harrison documentary? All his stuff is on the DVD, but he's not in the movie, even though they have all these interviews with him. Just imagine him going to the movie theater thinking, wow, this is great, this is a film about my friend, and I'm going to be in it, this is cool. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, I'm on the cutting floor. Oh, I'll tell you, no respect. <laughs> anyway, Jeff's association with George led to, the, led to the 1988 formation of the Traveling Wilburys. Please see our Traveling Wilburys episode for more. Thank you. <laughs> and I, he sings lead on one of their best songs on Handle with Care, Rattled. Rattled. Yeah. Love that song. Jeff would wind up producing Tom and Roy as well, but not Bob. Not yet, but there's still time. I remember Peg commented on our Traveling Wilburys episode. She said, please no. Please no. What? No Jeff producing Bob? No, she doesn't want to hear it. <laughs> oh, Peg, that would just be too interesting. <laughs> too, too interesting. Maybe it's better left to an alternate universe. 
I want to be in that universe. <laughs> Sorry, Peg. That's how I feel. In 1989, Jeff produced Tom Petty's Full Moon Fever album. Mm -hmm. And that and the Wilburys album both got Grammy noms. And the Wilburys won a Grammy for Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocals. That's actually a complicated category. Yeah, it sounds complicated. In 1990, Jeff put out a solo album, Armchair Theater. In, in 91, Jeff produced Tom again, this time with the Heartbreakers on Into the Great Wide Open. Is that where he appeared in the music video for I Won't Back Down with Ringo and George? I Won't Back Down was from Full Moon Fever. That was solo. Oh, so back, back then? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now, in 1994, at George's request... Jeff worked with George, Paul, and Ringo on the Beatles Anthology Project, which, re which resulted in a virtual reunion with John via the songs Free as a Bird and Real Love, which are kind of, eh. I mean, really? it doesn't soil the Beatles' legacy as a whole, but they're kind of like, meh. They've moved on to different stuff. We don't really need this. Yeah, it was kind of one of those things where it's like, I have to pretend that they don't exist, but they do. <laughs> Well, because like you listen to John's vocals, and it's obvious that he's in the he's, he's on being filtered he's on tape. Yeah, he's just being filtered. I think. Well, I, I like I'd like to think that Jeff did the best he could with with what he was presented. Yeah, because the other three they really wanted to do this. I mean, if they did it now, I think the technology would be better to where John wouldn't sound like he was coming from a tape recording. Yeah, it kind of sounded like he was singing in the shower. Ooh, well, I'm not being funny about that. It kind of has that sound to it. Well, maybe if they ever do a re-release of it, they can touch it up a little bit, yeah. and he'll sound better. Something, I guess. Mm. Okay, now, in 1997, Jeff saw the movie Boogie Nights before it was released to the public because director Paul Thomas Anderson wanted to use the ELO song, Living Thing, near the end of the movie when, oh, okay, that's when the Mark Wahlberg, as porn star Dirk Diggler, unleashes his uh, asset. Oh, dear. He now, whips it out. Je yes, I saw the movie. Yeah. Uh, Jeff has said he's not a fan of sex and violence in the movies, and he's very particular about his how his songs are used. Yes. And Paul Thomas Anderson said that Jeff was the only person who asked to see the movie first. Like, he he went to other people and said, hey, I want to use your song. Yeah, sure, no problem. Give me the money. But Jeff was the only one that said, well, I want to see this first. I want to see how it's used. Yep, so... When he saw the movie, he loved it. He he got it. <laughs> now, also in 97, he worked with Paul McCartney on Paul's Flaming Pie album. Flaming Pie? Why yes. is the pie on fire? Because it was hot stuff. I don't know. And, uh... and, and just a little shout out. Happy Pie Day, everyone. Happy Pie Day. This I is, made a sweet potato pie. This is being recorded on, yes, March 14th, 314. AKA 3.14159265538. That's as far as I can go. Thank you. You're welcome. And yes... He also produced Ringo, so Jeff got them all separately, too. What album for Ringo did he do? I don't know. It didn't say. Ah, oh, wah, wah. Sorry, Ringo. Sorry. Wah, wah. Now, in 2000, Jeff reactivated ELO, first with a box set mm -hmm. called... ELO? Flashback, I think. I can't remember. Sorry, I should have wrote it down. <laughs> Next with a new album called Zoom. Zoom. Ringo and George played on it. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. Cool. It got good reviews, but no singles came out and no tour. Wait, 2000? 2000. Oh, shit, before he died. Was that well, one of the last things that he did? Uh, nope. In 2001, Jeff worked <gasps> with George on what turned out to be Harrison's last album, Brainwashed. Oh, yeah, and then they worked with Danny on the rest of it. That's yep. right. George yeah. died November 29th, 2001. Now, George went back in the studio in 2002 to finish it. George Jeff. went back in the studio to finish it? Did I say George? Yes, Jeff. you did. Sorry, Jeff. I was about to say George is dead. How the hell can he go back? He was very spiritual. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, Jeff was the one who came back in the studio to finish it. <laughs> Jeff was also heavily involved with the concert for George at the Royal Abbott Hall mm -hmm. in November 2002. He sang lead on The Inner Light, mm -hmm. I Want to Tell You, mm -hmm. and Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth. And he sounded great. He also produced the surround sound audio mix of the concert for the DVD. That makes sense. For which he won a Grammy. You could win a Grammy? Oh, for best probably, recording of a concert? Uh, pre yeah, probably some sort of technical Grammy. Okay. But hey, it was good enough to win one. Yeah. And in 2004, he and Tom Petty inducted George into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Is that the one where Tom Petty goes on for forever and Jeff has to like rush the last five seconds or something? That's the one. I haven't seen it because I, cause I, I think I would feel very bad for Jeff and I would be like, come on, Tom, wrap it up. <laughs> um, since then, he put out another solo album. This time it was a bunch of covers. Mm -hmm. And he put, out, he put out albums under Jeff Lynn's ELO. 
Oh. He played the Grammys Beatles tribute in 2014. That he, was awesome. He did something, of course. No, that was the night that changed America. Was, That's the one, yeah. Was that done through the Grammys? That's the one. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Yep. Makes sense. Um, he did something, of course, with Joe Walsh, with whom he had just produced an album, and Danny Harrison. Yep. In 2017, he played Wembley again, this time in front of 60,000 fans with a generous 24-song set list. How he, many... How, how, how long would that be? Like, two hours? Depends how long the songs are. Well, ELO songs average, like, four minutes. So... You're going to make me do math? Well, no, no, no. Yeah, not, maybe, not two, right maybe two hours. Yeah. And remember how he was denied making secret messages into a two-disc set? Yeah. Well, in 2018, he got to put it out the way he had originally intended. Mm -hmm. ELO toured the U.S. and Europe in 2017-2018 and toured oh, yeah. the U.S. again in 2019 with Danny Harrison opening. Yeah, I saw that on uh, Danny Harrison's Facebook page. And to back up just a little bit, in 2017, Jeff, Bev Bevan, Richard Tandy, and Roy Wood got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as ELO, and Danny did the um, introduction. induction. Yep, you can find that all on YouTube. Yeah, I, I saw the induction on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame website, and... It was a little off the cuff. What do you mean, the speech? Yeah. I think Danny was nervous. I think he was too. Yeah. Like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm inducting these guys. Because the first thing he said was, if my dad was alive, he would be the one doing this. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. There was going to be a 2020 tour, but I think we know what happened. Yeah. But also in 2020, Jeff got to add the initials OBE after his name. Oh. Order of the British Empire. Officer of the most excellent order of the British Empire. But excellent I think it should D. be an O-M-E-O-B-E. O-M-E-O-B-E? -E? Yes. What? Order of the most excellent order of the British Empire. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. And whilst doing research on the order of the British Empire, there are people who want to change it to something else, British excellence, because they're like, well, we don't have an empire anymore. Not that anymore. That sounds very taking overish. It sounds very really imperialist. That's yeah. it. Thanks. That's a word. Yep. Okay, now, as for me, I always like this stuff on the radio. Mm -hmm. I got their 1979 ELO's Greatest Hits when I was 16. Years later, I got their two-disc anthology Strange Magic on CD, but it was a bit much. I found myself skipping over quite a few songs. Oh. So, Essential fits the bill for me. There were two songs that I wish that were on it. Ma, 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 Bell, and Showdown, because mm -hmm. they were both on Greatest Hits. But thanks to the magic of downloading, I have those two songs. Mm -hmm. Now, the only problem I have with Essential, and it's a small one, that's what she said. The new one is two discs. We're going to get into that. Oh, okay. The only problem I have with Essential is the songs aren't in chronological order. Oh, really? They're which just is, all over the place. Which has always been a feature of Sony's Essential series. Mm -hmm. Now, the Essential ELO came out in 2003. Five years later, it was rebranded as part of their, what they call, playlist series. Hmm. And it was playlist, the very best of the Electric Light Orchestra. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2011, the Essential Electric Light Orchestra was released or re-released as a two-disc set. But, mm -hmm. but with edited versions of some of the songs, oh. never a good thing. You've got all this time on the disc, fill it up. Mm -hmm. They were able to do it with Strange Magic. They could have done it with this one. Mm -hmm. Anyway... Let's review the songs. All right, song number one, Evil Woman. As soon as the orchestra plays those opening notes, it's a jolt to the system and you're intrigued, so I can see why they picked this as the opening track. I think this might be the best breakup song a person could dance to other than Enough is Enough with Barbra Streisand and Donna Summer. Wow, that's an uh, unusual combination. Hey, it kind of works. Breakup yeah. songs you can dance to. But think about it. There's reason to dance. The evil woman who hurt you is getting her comeuppance, and she comes crawling back to you, and you stand over her with a smile on your face. You want to know how you got here? Well, allow me to explain. And you just dance with joy. Two, di two tiny details I also love about this song. The brief little orchestral distortion in the middle, and Jeff Lynne paraphrasing Ben Franklin with, A fool and his money soon go separate ways, and you found a fool lying in a daze. Shows you're smart without being insufferable. Just the right touch. Nice. Yeah, this song also opened ELO's greatest hits, and I think it has to do with that song's opening. You just mm -hmm. hear it, and it just kind of like sucks you in. You're like, whoa! And then these keyboards kick in that make you wish you knew how to play the piano. Yeah. Uncle Joey knows how to do that. He knows how to play the soul for evil woman? Cool. Yep. As a great drum sound, and as for the woman in question, she sounds bad. But not evil. But truly evil. Maybe she was to Jeff. Yeah, that's, that's, that, yeah. I mean, I'd like some sort of concrete example, but this song is so catchy, I'm willing to overlook that. 
And with those ha-has, it sounds like Jeff got his payback. Uh-huh. But again, that's left to our imagination of how he got his payback. But he's feeling mm-hmm. pretty good about how things turned out. Who are we to rain on his parade? I don't know. Yeah. Next song. Do ya. Man. Yeah. Man. Ooh, that opening Man. guitar slide followed by that crescendo. When I saw the title, I thought, this can go one of two ways. <laughs> Either the title is a question, like, you know, like, do you love me? Or, yeah, baby, I'll do ya. Jeff's too polite for that. Yes, he's way too polite, quite. But again, those orchestrations, especially before the chorus with the but I and the <laughs> that wasn't my vocal best, sorry. And the harmonies layering on top of each other, and then becoming almost percussive with a musical triplet. I think you know, mm-hmm. and I think this is where ELO blows everyone's mind because you hear the guitar at the beginning, you think okay, a rock song, and then the orchestra comes in, and you can't believe how all the two go together. They're clever that way, and I can't get enough of it. Also, nice to see Jeff doing his Bob Dylan impression for the briefest moment. Where? Somewhere at the beginning. If you listen to it, you can hear it a little bit. All right, I'm going to think... (laughs) 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 Foreshadowing things to come. Maybe. Oh, no. (laughs) Maybe at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the great opening guitar riffs to open a a song ever. Yes, an an opening riff to open a song. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ever. It sucks you right in, and Mm -hmm. it's like you want to hear more of it, and you do get to hear it a few more times. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a remake of a song Jeff did when he was with The Move. Mm -hmm. Now, Yeah. Now, he wrote it himself, which, except for Rollo Beethoven, he wrote Wrote every single song and produced them all. He just, like, Mm -hmm. took over when Roy left. Cranked it out. Yep. Um, He'd sort of steal the riff again for his song Mama Bell, which is okay. I mean, he's, he's... He's stealing from himself. He's so, Jeff you know, It's fine. It's yeah, fine. Yeah. Now, lyrically with the song, Jeff has a lot of words coming out of his mouth. Okay. Like these really long lines. But he doesn't sound like obnoxiously smart. No, he doesn't sound like he's going to trip over it either. No. Some of the imagery would not be out of place on I Am the Walrus. I've, seen, like pig, I've seen pigs all sitting watching picture slides. Yeah, why are they watching picture slides? Unless it's the police and they're looking at suspects. Oh, maybe I it's, a, it's a reference know. to piggies? Could be. I don't know. Okay. But Jeff's never seen anything like this woman. Even though he wants to save her for a rainy day, he does say that. But what happens on the sunny ones? That's Just does his normal business. You know, okay. produces an album, wake up, go to bed. It rains, go see the woman. It's sunny, go do my stuff. Is she a concubine? I don't know. No, maybe just a side chick. Oh, okay. Yeah. Again, the overall song's catchiness makes up for the lack of logic, which is what the best rock and roll should do. Because let's face it, rock lyrics are not poetry. No. They're just not. Music critic Dave Marsh aptly used the word doggerel, which Oxford defines as verse or words that are badly written or expressed. And I cannot argue with that. Nope. And so we need a great riff or two to make up for the nonsense. <laughs> Good bands can do this. Great ones can do it consistently. Yes. All right. Can't get it out of my head. Okay, I have a question. So I was uh, I looked up all these songs on YouTube last night, matched them to the uh, timestamps on the back of the CD. And this uh, song is on their El Dorado album. Uh-huh. How did they get away with having a picture from The Wizard of Oz on the album cover? I'm sure they had to get permission. Oh, uh, yeah. I probably paid a lot of money. Great cover, though. Yeah. Okay. Jeff, I hate to break it to you, but I don't think you saw a mermaid. I think you saw a manatee. And like those sailors <laughs> who were high or hallucinating or whatever, you probably made out with a manatee. Or even worse. I think this is Jeff sounding like one of the Beatles, and I think it's him trying to sound as if John and Paul had a baby. As for the song, it's still fun and has a good quality of sound, but it's a bit too spaced out for me. Like, I don't hate it, but he does sound like he's on an LSD trip. Maybe if I was on that trip with him, then I'd be excited too seeing what Jeff was seeing. But since I can't, all I can do is shake my head, smirk, and think, God, he's so high right now. (laughs) Well, I kind of look at it as like the ocean's daughter as a muse, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, this is going on in his mind maybe either that well you know if you saw a woman working walking on a wave towards you you probably could never get that out of your head either Mm. but i kind of go with the muse thing i don't know why there seems to be some sort of like maybe greek odyssey Mm -hmm. fable thing going on anyway Mm -hmm. and the lines that always confuse me but i like okay uh, the lines about the uh, bank job in the city and robin hood william tell ivanhoe and lancelot yeah 
Mm-hmm. I don't get it. And favorite line, morning, don't get here tonight. Deathless. Morning gets here in the morning. Morning yeah. doesn't get here at night. No. Nope. And I like the synthesizer as electric harpsichord. Do we know we we we? Oh yeah, I guess it was yeah, a little bit of that. Yeah. This is my favorite song by them. I I've never really. Get, I never get tired of hearing this. Okay. One. And the crime on the new essential ELO two disc. It's not on there. They shaved a minute off. Oh why? I don't know. Like I said, they used like edited versions, or maybe they were single versions, and that's <sighs> always wrong. Oh, always God. always wrong. Okay, next track, Mr. Blue Sky. The moment I really remember hearing this song for the first time was in the opening credits for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Baby Groot plays this on Peter Quinn's mixtape, Awesome Mixtape Volume 2, and you see Baby Groot just dancing around to this while the Guardians are getting their asses kicked and everything is exploding around them. What you don't, what you couldn't hear in the movie was, Warning, today's forecast calls for sunshine, which I guess in England would be alarming. I find Jeff's vocal performance amusing here because he's able to sound just like Bob Dylan one minute, the sun is shining, and then John Lennon the next. I forget where he sounded like John, though. Speaking of John, you can hear the Beatles' influence in this song. Oh, yeah. First of all, the harmonies, we can all tell they sound like the Beatles' harmonies, and then there's the pounding of the hammer, which sounds like Maxwell's silver hammer. Then there's spoken distortions of Mr. Blue Sky that sound like something out of Kraftwerk. But, he st- but Jeff still incorporates his own touches with the arrangement of the background vocals, even though sometimes the women sound like they're singing underwater. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. can hear it, right? Yep. And then there's that ending where you sound like you're floating up to heaven on a cloud. I can see the last part being used as music in a ballet or being used in some sacrilegious interpretive dance. But underneath everything is a happy song about the English experiencing sunlight for the first time and absolutely losing their minds. But it's something anyone can relate to, especially after seeing more sunlight after dark winter. Winter, And then to conclude, we have a sound that is almost like the THX opening credits. Just yep. great song. What do you expect yep. me to say? Yeah. Yeah, like you said, I, today's kids will recognize this song from the hilarious opening of Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. I actually went on YouTube and watched it. Oh, you it, liked it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm like, Oh, yeah, I remember this. That was hysterical. Yeah. And Groot, he's got some good dance moves. Yes, I, he does. I, I give him credit for dance to a song like this. Yeah. Now, Mr. Blue Sky is the closing part of a suite of songs from Out of the Blue called Concerto for a Rainy Day. Oh. Excuse me. I don't see. Yeah, so it kind of makes sense lyrically with some of the things about, you know, uh, forecast calls for blue skies and um, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. I can't remember any of the, of the other lyrics at the moment. Yeah, I think it kind of borrows or steals from the Beatles altogether now. A, B, C, D, sun is shining out. Yep. Okay, I can see it. Okay. All right, next track. Just a, oop, no, I'm not done yet. Sorry, I didn't I'm know. not done yet. All right. Just a peeing to the perfect weather day. Mm-hmm. And yes, how about that ending? The chorus at the end. Sounds like the clouds are parting, the sun breaks through when those mm-hmm. violins kick in, and then it just all calms down. There's just the blue sky going on forever. Mm-hmm. Now, how's that for poetry? Thank yeah. you. Now, to me, the visual equivalent of this song would be the cover to the It's a Be- the first It's a Beautiful Day album. Oh, with the girl in the hat? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that was the band's name, It's a Beautiful Day. Yeah. It's an illustration of a woman standing on a hill basking in the perfect day dominated by this perfect blue sky and there's probably a slight breeze because she's got to hold on to her hat so it doesn't blow off doesn't that album suck though no there's one have to have great song on it called white bird okay which i brought the disc from the library and downloaded it but i actually saw the vinyl itself at uh four records antiques and you framed it got it for four bucks framed it I just got to find a space to Put hang it. it up somewhere. Because if you look behind you, it's over there in the corner. I can't see it without my glasses. Oh, trust me. Oh, wait it's... a minute. I think I passed it by before. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There it is. I see it now. Okay, okay now, Mr. Blue Sky, that is my second favorite yellow song. Okay, good choice. All right. Strange Magic. Okay, this song definitely feels 70s, but not in a bad, cringy way, in a comfortable <laughs> way. Which makes me want to ask something. Go ahead. So in the 70s, the most popular dance song at weddings was You Light Up My Life by Debbie Boone, which I have danced to before in ballroom dance lessons for waltz because it's a slow enough tempo where you can kind of get the one, two, three, one, okay. two. So I'm I so want to ask, why wasn't this a popular wedding song? 
Strange magic? Yeah, I can see it working. Huh? Really? I, right? You thinking about it? See it, I guess. Yeah. I mean, tempo wise. Yeah, I can see a couples. I can see couples in the '70s slow dancing to this, romantic and cute, without being too sacred. All right. So uh, if you if you ever get married someday, I expect you to. No. This. Well, ah! no, I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'll get into that I, later. Are you holding out till twenty <laughs> seventy? God, no. A bit off kilter, but not enough to be pretentious. And while he says the dream will end, it ends with them falling in love, maybe even deeper than before, not with something terrible happening. I feel like you could slow dance to this now, but it might be too dated for today. Although, if you and your partner like it, then go for it. Like, I don't want to pick a song that my partner is not going to like. Mm-hmm. Sweet song, very and very good, but I don't think it's one of the best on here. Good, but... Yeah, you know, I have yeah. no idea what this song's about. It's about love. None. Okay. It's a love song. That's all you need. It's something about Jeff Streams working a strange magic on him. Mm. I, I he he does write about dreams a lot in the, in his songs. I wonder what his dreams are like. I don't know. Maybe this is him trying to tell us. He's getting critical respect in his dreams. Huh. I don't know. <laughs> God. Um, when, when I when I scanned the lyrics on um, azlyrics dot com, I noticed that the bulk of them are the chorus, which works for me because it's very catchy. Yeah. And I love the strings of that going up. Go down. down. Mm-hmm. It sounds better in the song. Yeah. Than that. Mm-hmm. All right, next track. Living Thing. Ooh, we need more violin and saxophone duets. Because the two instruments, they're often associated with romance and sex. And I never thought of pairing them together, but it should be done more often. Now, this song is fine, and it still has a great sound. But it feels like a repeat of Strange Magic because they share the same theme and they both say the word magic. I also think that maybe ending with a fade-out wasn't the right choice, because this is ELO. You expect some sort of climax, be it piano or fortissimo. So not my favorite song. Good music, but could have used different lyrics. Uh, the chorus worked so well for Boogie Nights. Oh, my God. <laughs> as soon as soon as the song started coming, I, was, I just lost it. I just started laughing out loud. Hmm. It's a living thing. It's a terrible thing to lose. And it would be. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah, the verses... More dream imagery, I guess. And as an aside, not to sound lazy, I really do listen to and read the lyrics of the songs we discuss, but God help me, a lot of time, I have no idea what their point is supposed to be. Nah. Again, dog roll. But you know what? Maybe it's just not worth the investment of my brain cells. I don't know. I mean, I, I will try. I will give it, like, you know, so much time until I have to throw up my hands and say, you know, the hell with it. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's why the choruses are a lot in a lot of pop music are more intelligible than the verses. Fats Domino was the one who said you should never sing the lyrics out very clearly. Really? Because his thing was like, let people try and figure out what's going on. Huh. And then Mick Jagger picked that up, but he kind of went a little better where you understand all the choruses to their songs, but you have no idea what's going on in the... In the verses. I can't get no. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. Turn to stone. Okay. I know this song is supposed to be romantic, but it rubs me the wrong way. She leaves the house and he completely shuts down. Dude, you need a life outside your partner. <laughs> you cannot let them be the center of your world. Otherwise, you'll be burnt out and they're going to crumble under the pressure. As for the little rap section, I think that's what I'm calling it. It just feels like someone trying to prevent you from leaving by barraging you with toxic pleas. I guess this is supposed to be romantic, Jeff. I'm sorry, but with the repetition, it just sounds like someone who's too clingy. And it doesn't move me to passion. It makes you want to run the hell away, especially with the hellish ending. Although I do appreciate a reference to the Beatles a day in the life with that end of the world sound at the end. Yeah. 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 Now, with the fade-in, this is the song that opened the two record set out of the blue. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense. It's like the songs just come out of the... Well, you know. Mm-hmm. Jeff's woman is gone, and he can't carry on. He's like a mess. Either she's got, like, something that no one else in the world has, mm-hmm. or he's just kind of a needy guy and needs to, like, like you said, get a life. Occupy, take up a hobby. Make some puzzles. Do crosswords. She's going to come back mm-hmm. eventually, maybe, but not if you keep acting this desperate. Yeah. And like he's paralyzed by it. And, you know, after all these days, I still cannot sing along to that. Yes, I'm turning the stone because you ain't coming home, as you call it, the rap part. Yeah, it just well, that's the closest thing fast. I could think of to yeah. call it, yeah. And, yeah, how about that ending? It just builds and builds and builds as it fades out. It's almost like the opposite 
of what you said about a day in the life where it's like that that one chord and it's just going on and on and it fades out. But this is like it's like it's building and building and building and you're wondering what's going on, what's going to happen, and then you don't hear the chord. You're denied. Yep. Now, if you get a chance, check out the lyrics on azlyrics.com because um, the words with which the chorus responds at the end of each line in the verses are all in caps. Really? It's hilarious. Okay. It's like, it's like I feel like I'm being yelled at here. Maybe they're trying to make themselves heard over the music. Or maybe they think, well, more than one person singing this. A lot of people are singing this, so it needs to be big. Big, yeah. All right. Sweet Talking Woman. Sounds like someone said the wrong thing to this Sweet Talking Woman, because apparently there's been a communication breakdown, and now she's on the run. Uh-oh. Also, this may be the first time on the show I've heard a reference to insufficient data coming through in a rock song. Which is interesting because I feel like that's more applicable to trying to find someone using today's technology as you try to Google them to no avail. Well, maybe it was like uh, computers were starting, maybe. I well, mean, you couldn't just... really search for someone on the internet back then. No. But Jeff clearly misses this woman's voice. and He's willing to tie up as many phone lines and plunge through as many databases as he can. Maybe he'll even hack the Matrix. Who knows? Another song about how love drives you mad but doesn't grab me. It also ends on a disappointing fade out, but maybe to signify that I'll be searching for her long after we stop listening to him. Yeah. Now, to me, Jeff's voice sounds a little different on on the verses. Like, he's singing in, like, a lower register than he normally does. Okay, well, yeah, people sound different when they do that, so... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I do like the Led Zeppelin reference to communication breakdown. Oh, that's what that was. Yep. Okay. Yep. And at three th- at three minutes thirteen seconds, things go disco for about five seconds because this was nineteen seventy seven after mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. And who is the sweet talking woman exactly? Mm-hmm. Is it the operator mentioned at the beginning? I was waiting for the operator on the line. She's gone so long. What can I do? Oh, is he on a phone sex line or something? Um, I don't know when that industry began. No. It might have been towards the end of the seventies. It's a good possibility. But like I said, Jeffrey, he's polite. His mom's never had to come out and say, oh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Oh, damn it. I was going to reference <laughs> that later. I want to be the first one to say that. God damn it. Right. And, um, yeah, he's, he's. Um, I like how Jeff's, ah, where am I? Ah, she's gone so long. What can I do? Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. I'm sorry. I'm just mixing myself up. Okay. Let's go on to the next song, please. All right. Telephone line. Not going to lie, the beginning of the song had me worried because I thought my headphones short-circuited and needed charging. <laughs> I was like, no, I just bought these, but it was fine. Okay, this song is beautiful, but I think I'd have to be in the right headspace to hear it because I could picture myself listening to this song on a really bad day and sobbing my eyes out, but it's beautiful. I feel like this is Jeff writing an early version of Time After Time, only the feelings of love and friendship aren't mutual. Or maybe they are mutual, but she's so far away he doesn't know if the person on the other end not answering the phone feels the same. Today it would probably cut to the answering machine, but I think back then it would cut to an answering service. And I'm sorry, while this song is beautiful, I can think of two comedic endings. One is Jeff looking down and realizing he's been dialing the wrong number and immediately swearing his head off. <laughs> or the other is, she picks up, he panics, and hangs up immediately. Oh, oh yeah. But then she knows it's him. It's like that episode of Coupling where um, they were waiting for the phone to ring at uh, Steve and Susan's. Oh, yeah. What were they waiting for? It would ring once for? they get the trip when they broke up. And they're like, I got the trip. I got the trip. I think it's her. How do you know? You didn't pick it up. Yeah, that's her trip. Oh, okay. That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually, back in the day when I first moved out, I had the intro of this song as my answering machine message once. Nice. kind of long, I know. But Ooh, if, it... if you want to leave a message, you are going to stick it out. Mm. Um, I appreciate how Jeff waits the um, standard time between telephone rings, like a real phone. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. As opposed to like one right after the other right after the other. Mm-hmm. And it, it kind of gives you that, is someone going to pick up? Is it going to happen? Why am I waiting? Why is no one answering? Hmm. And I like how Jeff's voice fades in. Like he so- he sounds like he's on an actual telephone at first. Yeah, it but does. then he gets clearer and clearer. Yep. And yeah, he's calling to find out where it all went wrong, and she's not answering. And you know what? At least he's just not showing up at her place unannounced. Yeah. Manners matter. Now I have a question. How did people record uh, songs for their answering machines back in the day? Oh my God, <laughs> this was tough. I think I had 
um, oh my god, I had this song mm-hmm. on cassette, mm-hmm. which I taped from my vinyl, and so I had a portable little tape player. I had to hold it up to the answer machine, <laughs> press record. That's what I thought. Yep. Hey, you know, and that was 1991, I think I did that. Gotcha. Um, yeah, you kids. You got it made. <laughs> and right. the, uh, uh, I wish the, we could have songs for our answer machines, though. That would be fun. Well, you could probably do the same thing if you get that old technology. Hold it up to the machine. And, oh, yeah, record a new voicemail and then just hold it up to the speakers. Yep. Um, the, <laughs> Maybe I'll do the police one. Is that my mother on the phone? I did that one once. Mind. Yeah, you told me that. Yep. And I, well, the first time I listened to that song, I freaked the hell out. I was scared. I was like, <laughs> and I actually did a couple of um, Bart Simpson uh, calls to Moe's. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Um, the line about Blue Days, Black Nights is a nod to the Buddy Holly song of the same name. Mm-hmm. All right. Next track, Shine a Little Love. Very mystical opening. And then and the album cover for this was, like, I think a, a Sikh or some sort of uh, either an Indian Sikh or a Middle Eastern guy in a turban holding up ELO's album in his hands. And the rest of this song shoots off like a rocket after that introduction. I mm-hmm. almost jumped. I actually jumped in my chair. But, wow, this song is fun. I was dancing to it while checking on my sweet potato pie in the oven last night. Jeff is reminding his partner, look, you don't have to worry. I love you, and no matter what, we're going to have fun together. It seems like he cheers his partner up because we have a bit of a call and response. Can you understand? Yes, I understand, etc. And I think I noticed something interesting about Yellow. With some of their songs, they're trying to create dance songs without being 70s disco. Interesting you should mention that. And it works. And I think this is the song where the fade out really works because you can see the two characters dancing it out into the night and having fun. Mm -hmm. Now, uh... In doing this podcast and listening to these songs, Uh this was the first time I listened to this on headphones, and I never knew how trippy that intro was. Right. I mean, I I was just surprised. I'm like, like, I've heard this song so many times, and I never noticed that before. Mm -hmm. That happened with a couple of other ones, too. Um, I think it might have been um, maybe Hold On Tight. It was like a little part of the beginning, which I never noticed before, but the Mm -hmm. headphones really brought it out. Mm -hmm. Anyway... Yeah, it is kind of a disco-sounding song without being overtly so. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with disco. Yours truly has, you know, a few, few albums. Nile Rodgers and Chic. Donna Summer. Donna Summer, yeah. Dr. Buzzard, Savannah Band. Mm-hmm. Uh, Saturday Night Fever. You have to have Saturday Night Fever. Oh, a bunch of people. Oh, by the way, Nile Rodgers was in the news recently. Because I think he had to, he was testifying before UK courts about copyright laws. Ooh, nice. Hope yeah. he wins. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, for this song, it sounds like keyboards have replaced the strings at this point. Mm-hmm. Catchy chorus as always, but for me, kind of so-so version versus you got a, you got a lot more out of it than I did. Yeah, I liked it. But I like that. <laughs> Which almost sounds like Barracuda by heart. Or uh, Achilles' Last Stand by Led Zeppelin. Honestly, with the dum 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 dum, I expected the bonanza. Yes, exactly. That's why I went da da da. All right. I <laughs> then the we... burning nap. <laughs> but you know what's funny? But on, be, be burning up the dance floor instead. Yeah, but on the on the Roku channel where they have Bonanza, Mom wanted to watch a few episodes. They don't have the theme song. Because I guess Roku couldn't afford to buy the copyright for it, so they just replaced it with some sort of generic music. And my mom, mom looked at me and she went, This sucks. Wow. Yeah. So basically, you would have to go to YouTube, watch the intro, and then switch over to the... To the show, yes. Wow. All wow. right. Next song, Hold On Tight. But a lot of people, on I think when they were searching for it on Google, they typed in Hold On Tight to your dream, but they didn't know that the, song, the title was just Hold On Tight. Interesting. Another song where the intro wakes you up and having you sit forward yep. in your seat. I think in this song, you hear the influence of the American rock and roll that inspired the British rockers. The one thing I don't know how I feel about is the French reprisal of the first verse. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, it's just the first It's just the first lines of the song, but in French. Mm-hmm. His pronunciation is fine, but why put it there? Is it because the Beatles put a melange of Portuguese, Spanish, and Italian on the Abbey Road with that one song? Oh, maybe Michel, my bell. Oh, yeah, maybe. Did Jeff want to show off? Did they have a huge base of French fans they just wanted to give a shout-out to? Begs the question. But I still have fun with this song, and Jeff is teasing us in a way because he doesn't vocally go up on... Hold on tight to your dream until the very end. To your dream. And when he does, the payoff is awesome. Mm-hmm. All right, are you going to talk about the coffee commercial? I'm going to talk about the coffee commercial. All right. This was once used in the coffee commercial in which David Bowie appears. Yeah. It's a cameo, yeah. Coffee Achievers, baby. It's 1984 Something. all over again. Mm-hmm. And now we all know Kurt Vonnegut's writing secret. A nice cup of coffee. Mm-hmm. 
It's just weird seeing those commercials. I was surprised that... And Cicely Tyson is in them, too. Me? I won? I won some award? It's hilarious if you... If, of course you won an award. She's Cicely Tyson. If you get a chance, check out the commercials on YouTube. They are hysterical. Mm-hmm. Especially with Hart mixing their album. And they're at the soundboard. And Anne and Nancy have cups of coffee. And I'm thinking, if either of you spill that... You're fucking dead. You are so screwed. You're going to owe the studio so, so much money. Yes, you are so screwed. Yeah. Um, it's a nice hang in there. You can do a type of song. And like, I assume the French part is just to make it sound international. Like you said, maybe they had a lot of French fans and hey, you know, give a nod to them. Yeah. Um, this came out in 1981 and it sounds like it. And that's not a bad thing. But I mean, at this point, it's definitely bye bye strings. Strings are just... Pfft, gone. Mm -hmm. Though I will say when Jeff reactivated ELO he wanted to bring strings back. He wanted to go um, go back to the beginning. Yeah. All right. Uh, Calling America. Yeah, what do you want? I'm sorry. Listening to this song is kind of funny now because Jeff's girl is in America and you can't call her over in England which I'm sure back then was expensive as hell to call someone over in another continent. Yeah, but if you're Jeff Lynn, you've, you've got some cash. That's true, but maybe he's cheap. But nowadays, well, I don't know. But nowadays we have Zoom and Skype, so I don't think this song would be a problem today. Then again, maybe she gave him a bad number on purpose. Oh. Uh Uh-oh. Also, she was told that there was a place like heaven, which I have to say, living in this country and listening to this song post the former guy's presidency, I'm like, oh, honey, no. (laughs) Go somewhere where the fate of the world isn't up in the air every four years. (laughs) No. Well, this is... Right, this is from 1986, right before uh, Jeff called it a D-A-Y for ELO mm-hmm. and produced Cloud9 for George soon after in 87. Yep. This song is, it's it's okay. It's yeah, not it's meh. overly memorable. I mean, you listen to it and, you, and it does sound like it's the end of the band. It's, you know, and it's kind of like, more like the band had to end. It almost sounds like, and this is, this is not... A pun, sorry. And what sounds like it's kind of like phoned in, like, okay, this is our contractual obligation album. Let's mm-hmm. just throw up something against something. the wall and see what it sticks. Yeah. It's okay. But, eh. Yeah. All right. Rock and roll is king. I mean, I didn't expect you to say it blows. <laughs> <laughs> now, at first, I thought that this was the this was the song that was used in the movie, but because there was clips of it, used, there was a clip of, from another movie where this song was played, I guess. So I don't know. Okay, I have to say, I think I prefer Rattled on the Traveling Wilburys. Both of these songs could have come out in the 50s, but Rattled is more subtle. Nothing is wrong with saying rock and roll is great, but I've heard it before from Jeff Lynne in so many words. But this song also ticked me off in a way with all the whamma lamas because now I think we know who wrote Margarita. And we all know how I feel about that song. <laughs> you can hear my full thoughts in our review of Traveling Wilburys Volume 1. <laughs> oh, man. So thanks, Jeff, for birthing that into the universe. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And I, I gotta say, for for this song, it's you know, again, you miss a lot when you don't have headphones on. That first five seconds, I never noticed before. Nothing revelatory, but still, it just took me by surprise. And I gotta say, this is a decent Chuck Berry riff. I mean, mm-hmm. hell, he refers to him with "She rolled over Beethoven and gave Tchaikovsky back." And I gotta I say, thought that was also referenced in their "Roll Over Beethoven." Well, yeah, like I said, it, okay, it's a, it's a. He, oh, refers to, okay. he refers to, to Chuck Berry. And I got to say, you know, when you talked about Rattled and Rock and Roll is King and it's kind of covering the same ground, it's probably, I, I think I think it has to do with the um, the areas that he was in. Like he's doing his ELO thing, then he's doing this completely different thing with George, Roy, Tom, and Bob, who mm-hmm. are definitely going to put in their opinions about how they think it should sound. Yeah. And plus, he was co-producing the Wilburys with George. Yes. So I think that probably has a lot to do with it, too. Mm-hmm. Um, that little organ part in there, that would have my f- fellow Portuguese on the dance floor so fast. Probably. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, but when I think of Portuguese music, I don't think of dance. I think of fadu and crying. Well, another another, another one that always got my peeps out on the floor was Come Dancing by the Kinks. Really? 19, I think that was 1983, yeah. But... Uh, oh, yeah, it definitely has a Portuguese influence. Okay, but isn't there another song called Come Dancing that's more of a 50s American standard or something? 
Maybe I have no idea what you're talking about. I heard Bruce Forsyth sing at one time on Strict, uh, da, 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 Strictly Come Dancing. I don't well, know. Let's move on, shall we? Yes, let's. All right, don't bring me down. So I saw the opening of the music video, and oh my god, the animated woman at the beginning with those thick thighs, thick with two C's, is a precursor to Sienna the Elf from P- P.M. Seymour's videos. All right, I gotta go see that video then. All right, and then I'll show you Sienna to give you an example. For those of you who don't know, Sienna is the curvy little elf who loves cake and is always checking to make sure your posture is good like the adorable little waifu she is. Is she from a movie or something? No, P.M. Seymour created her as an animated character. P.M. Seymour? He's the guy who does the late night Tumblr posts. Oh, I love that guy. Yeah. All right. So as for the song, it's there. You know, it's fine. I just prefer the Beatles Don't Let Me Down. And also it's probably because I can't take Jeff seriously when he's trying to scold me considering he reminds me of a big fuzzy bear. So when he's mad, I go, yeah, sure. A fuzzy bear who could bite your head off. Fuzzy, wuzzy, wuzzy. Fuzzy, wuzzy, wuzzy. Like fuzzy, wuzzy bear from Between the Lions. Uh-huh. Or fuzzy bear. I used to think he reminded me of fuzzy bear for some weird reason. Oh, Jeff Lynn? Yeah, and I don't know why. Cause, I don't cause, know why either. Because he was like, Jeff Lynn looked like a fuzzy bear. Fuzzy's a fuzzy bear. I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, yeah. so are you done with this song? Yes. Okay. <laughs> now, I know what the what you're thinking. Mm-hmm. What the heck is Groose? Because he sings... Don't bring me down. Groose. You know what it is? It's a sound effect? It's G-R-O-O-S. It's a placeholder. Because Jeff used it to fill in the lyrical gap. He was trying to come up with some sort of word. He couldn't. Well, it turns out the word Groose is German for greetings. So he left it in. Oh, Groose. Yeah, so it kind of worked out. Everyone thought it was Don't Let Me Down Bruce. And everyone's wondering, who's Bruce? Who's Bruce? Or Bruce? Bruce. No one knew. (laughs) I almost said (laughs) Bruce. Like the Portuguese kids, and they go to see the psychic medium. We're paying money to see a bruxa. That, mean, that means witch for you non-Portuguese types out there. Yeah, li- literally witch. It just means witch, nothing else. This song contains one of my favorite best dumb lyrics ever. What? One of these days, you're going to break your glass. Mm-hmm. So polite. Mm-hmm. Just just so polite. Mm-hmm. Not one of these days you're going to fall on your ass. Mm-hmm. Just you're going to break something. Probably your glass. You know, if you're Jewish, you must be confused by that because you break the glass at the weddings with your foot and then you go mazel tov and it's all happy and then you go eat. Well, maybe he means one of these days you're going to go off and marry someone else and convert and then break your glass. So don't bring me down. Uh All right, so. And that concludes the essential EL. No, 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 no. no. We're talking about this. Wait a minute. All right. There's one more. You don't like this one? You like this one? Well, okay, let's Have get into this. Go, right. ahead. Go ahead. Okay, roll over Beethoven. First thing, no Google. It was written by Chuck Berry, not the Beatles. Because the weird thing is when you Google it, it says, roll over Beethoven by the Beatles. But when you see the lyrics on Google and scroll down, it goes, song by Chuck Berry. Well, yeah, because they did a cover of it. Yeah, but I was like, Google, pick both, not two different ones, because that's just going to confuse people who are listening to this for the first time. Okay. So, anyway. Continue. Now that that's out of the way, I have to say that Jeff Lynne does an excellent Beatles-esque woo. Because he goes woo a couple of times. Yeah, okay. It is good. I remember when Dad first told me about this version of the song, I thought it was genius to put one of Beethoven's symphonies into the song. And I guess Jeff chose the fifth because it was going to fit the arrangement he came up with. I must also say, Jeff rocks harder with this song vocally than George. And that's not a dig at George at all, whom I love and adore. But Jeff just has this rocky growl to his voice that makes him sound like a rock singer. And to be fair, George was just a kid when he did that cover. I think a little younger than me, so I don't think he could have done that growl. But I never thought I'd say this. I'm disappointed that we do not have the full eight-minute version on here. And I will say, I will try to listen to it after this episode is over, because I think I can hear where parts are missing. I think I can pick up where the gaps are, especially since Jeff starts to sound drunk as he rambles on after a while. Like, roll over Beethoven, roll over Beethoven. Oh, Jeffrey. Maybe his voice was blowing out. Yeah. Oh, Jeffrey. But the end with the final notes of Beethoven's fifth is nice to hear, because I like hearing it in a different key, which you don't often hear. So I thought it was okay. Hello, punch bowl? Yeah, got a turd for you. Be right over. Oh! <laughs> I mean, it starts off like you'd expect ELO to start it off with Beethoven's ba, fifth. Ba, ba, Makes ba. sense. Yeah. But Walter Murphy did it better with his song, A Fifth of Beethoven, which is a, believe it or not, disco version of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Oh, I've heard that. Judge Judy uses that on her show, right? Really? The, 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 with the rock and roll sort of thing going on? I da, 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 da. don't watch da, 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 da. Judge Judy. It's the no, that's different. That's something different. Really? You're one of the few Portuguese people who doesn't watch Judge Judy. I am. 
Yeah, remember that skit where they get pulled over by the police? We're going to tell your boss. You're going to tell my lieutenant? The big boss. My commissioner? No, the big, big boss. Who? Judge Judy. <laughs> uh-huh. Anyway, like I said, Walter Murphy did this better. Mm-hmm. Um, and Walter Murphy would go on to score for Family Guy. It seems that it. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, oh, me for, for me, the orchestral parts are just awful. Really? Somewhere, so somewhere, this is making Chuck Berry roll over, and, and it's making, making Beethoven roll over, probably, and it's making me lose my lunch. Really, I thought the orchestra did <clears throat> fine. I, I do not have this on my iPod, but for the sake of the podcast, I pulled out the CD and forced myself to listen to it for you, the listeners. I did it for you. Be grateful. <laughs> this version is bloated, and Chuck Berry's songs are anything but. His is 2 minutes and 23 seconds. This monstrosity is 4 (laughs) minutes and 31 seconds. And God help me, as you said, there's an 8... This is just an edit of an 8-minute version that's out there somewhere that Uh I don't need to listen to. So even with this 4 minute and 31 second monstrosity, you could listen to Chuck Berry's version almost twice in the same amount of time that it would take you to listen to this once. In fact, gentle listener... That's what you should do. You should listen to Chuck's song twice. We're going to cover Chuck one Hell, day. Hell, listen to the Beatles version with George on lead double tracks. They got it. They kept theirs at like two Three and minutes, change. Yeah. A little under, under two minutes, a little longer than Chuck's, but still. Mm-hmm. Don't have a problem with their version. And um, maybe I should save this story for when we do Chuck someday, but what the heck, I'll tell it now. Okay. The reason he wrote the song was that in their house... Um, his sister was all about the classical piano, and he wanted to like get into this rock and roll and bang out fun tunes. So he kind of looked at it as like, no, this is the new music that's coming along. Mm-hmm. So, you know, roll over Beethoven. Plus, maybe Beethoven might even be into it. You never know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, this is, to me, this is just... Okay, okay, we get it, we get it. Pucalicious. Yeah. All right, so I've got a confession to make. I've listened to this album before, sort of. I think this is when we were reviewing the Traveling Wilburys, and you said you would have been a, uh, an ELO fan back in the day, probably. So I was like, okay. So I listened to it. The problem was I had a medium iced decaf Dunkin' Donuts coffee with cream and caramel, except they got my order wrong, and they didn't give me decaf. They gave me caffeinated coffee. So I'm sitting there listening to this album, the caffeine coursing through my body, and I'm listening to this album all spaced out. Then I'm like, whoa. Because the caffeine just has me so energized that listening to this music, I was like, where is this boot? Like, I was, I was crying while I was listening to it because I was just so out there. I guess for me, this is the equivalent of listening to an album on drugs. Uh-huh. Well, caffeine is considered one. Yeah. So now that I've listened to this album sober, overall, Yellow's awesome. Not every song was great, but all of them were good. And when the, the ones that were great just soared. I think I would have been an ELO stan if I grew up in the 70s. I probably would have never shut up about them being true art, but that's not to put them down. They are very artistic. So it's not quite the same as when I first listened to this album with caffeine jitters, but I still dance and had fun all the same. Mm-hmm. Now, despite that last song, this is an extremely strong ELO collection. Oh, yeah. One disc is pretty much all anyone needs for, like, the casual fan. I think if you want to explore more, definitely go for the Strange Magic compilation. I'm pretty sure you can probably find it on Amazon. It's still out there. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I wish this song All Over the World was on here, but, hey, you know, mm-hmm. I can probably find Strange Magic at the library and get it from there. Yeah. All right, as always, thank you for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. Like, comment, subscribe, tap the bell, and all that jazz. Follow me on all my social media platforms if you want to know when the next episode is coming out. And maybe when I have my acting website up, I'll be able to post the episodes on there. And if you're friends with my dad and you want to get the episodes through him, you can email them right to your inbox. Thank you for listening to another installment of My Dad Listens to This. We'll be back next time with another album to nitpick and gripe about. Dad, any final words for our viewers? Nope. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening, and happy pie day. Go eat a slice of pie. You deserve it.